Welcome to the fine print, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Caleb Teske, and today we are taking a little pause from the cannabis stuff to welcome my homie Merrick LaRock to the show, Mavstar. Uh, welcome to the program, sir. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Is it LaRock? Did I say that right? It's actually just Lawrence. 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 Yes. But I like LaRock. That sounds like a, like a supervillain or something. <laughs> uh, Lawrence. Damn, that was less exciting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> less European. You're supposed to be a suave European. I know, gentleman. seriously. I haven't had any Europeans on yet. You got to be my, <laughs> my cultured world traveler here. Um, before we get into anything serious, would you mind uh, sharing your five minute life story with us, sir? Sure, I could do that. Um, take 10 if you need. Okay, well, basically. Hell, um, I was born in Burlington. My parents moved here in 1986, I think. From where? Uh, from the former Czechoslovakia. Uh, basically, there was like the communist, like the Soviet regime was like in control of the government at the time. And it was kind of oppressive and you couldn't have like free speech and stuff. And my dad was kind of the kingpin of the whole operation to get my family out of there so they emigrated here at 86 and so was this like right after the ussr like sort of fractured or right before then or something like right there? before then yeah okay and then i was born like this like right around the same time the they had velvet revolution and the czechoslovakia split into two countries czech republic and slovakia and they had the they adopted their own government and stuff like that. I was born around that same time. So, um, you know, I went to school in Burlington, elementary school, middle school. Uh, I went to UVM. I, uh, I What'd you do at playing. UVM? I was a um, music theory and composition major at UVM. Word up. And UVM was cool. I, uh, you know, I'm a clar I'm a clarinet player, so I basically took clarinet lessons from this awesome guy, Stephen Klamowski, from eighth grade up until my sophomore year of college. And I think my clarinet years, like the years that I spent focusing heavily on clarinet, kind of influenced me a lot. Um, to you be still playing. Kinda, I took a break, you know, I haven't been playing like at all, basically, but um, I don't know, sometimes you want to just like take a break from stuff, so I haven't been playing it, but um, it was cool, I mean, um, and I played, uh, I was in this documentary for, uh, you know, I played in this orchestra called yeah, Me Too that was Orchestra. Good. Please, yeah, and that was the next one. Yeah. It's called Me Too Orchestra. It was founded in Burlington. It was the first orchestra for people with mental health issues and people who support them. And I played with them for a long time until now I'm just kind of taking a break because the rehearsal day falls on a day I have to like work the next day and I have to get up really early. So it's not really that convenient. But I was in this documentary called Orchestrating Change where a few years ago they followed me like some cool women from uh los angeles uh barbara molter wellen and margie friedman they're the executive producers of the of the documentary but they followed me around with cameras and like asked me questions and uh you know i th i feel like we completely went past the point i, w I wanted to make that uh when I was in college, that was the first time I found out, I realized I have like mental health issues, like serious mental health issues. What, what kind of where, stuff are you dealing with, Merrick? If you don't mind me asking. Well, my first, uh, my first diagnosis was bipolar type one or bipolar mixed. It was kind of both. Um, you know, it would be characterized by having, uh, 
alternating depressive episodes where I'm just depressed for no reason, even though there's like nothing that would make me particularly want to be depressed, but I just am anyway, not being interested. You know, just like not being interested in anything, not wanting to take a shower, not wanting to eat or take care of myself or anything. And that would be alternating with, uh, you know, manic episodes. And the manic episodes, those were a little more intense. So those were characterized by kind of having visual and auditory hallucinations, delusions of grandeur, just have losing losing my connection with reality and being sort of caught up in a story that's unfolding in front of me i guess it's comparable to having a bad acid trip but like really going off the rails so i i had that happen around 2009 and it was like you know, when all these doctors are talking to you and you're in the hospital and you don't know what's going on and suddenly they're telling you you're going to have to take all these pills for the rest of your life and some of them make you want to sleep all day. Some of the pills make you gain a lot of weight. It's like, it's almost like this, it's almost like this death sentence. Like, oh, what, my life was going normal up until now but now i have to deal with all this stuff that like i basically can't be normal like is this gonna be what my life is gonna be like for the rest so, of my life? so you've been dealing with this for about what 13 years or so you said yeah about 13 years and it just kind of did it just kind of set in like that because i imagine if you've never experienced any kind of auditory or visual hallucination and then you just started having them out of nowhere it could be yeah. very um disorienting or, or scary even yeah it was for the most part it was kind of out of nowhere um i was in my junior year of college when it first started but one thing i remember um one thing i remember is it first started happening after i tried lsd for the first time mm. So I use that as a cautionary story to people. Like if you're going to experiment with hallucinogens, just know that if you have anything underlying that hasn't come out yet, know that like, you know, people are like, ha ha, you know, hallucinogens. I'm going to sit around my room and watch music videos and listen to music and watch TV shows and just have a fun time. Like everybody, and even in the kind of popular culture, it's kind of, has it kind of has this like fun aspect kind of promoted about it but I would caution people against hallucinogens who especially if they've never tried them before because like I don't know if this is true or not but I've heard that if people have like are predisposed with certain mental conditions it can like bring about those symptoms in people so I've yeah. also heard that a lot. That I thought yeah. that was a great uh, heads up there because, yeah, uh, especially like people with underlying um, schizophrenic tendencies, I've heard mm-hmm. um, that can really bubble that to the surface. Um, and you know, like one of my friends from college um, was diagnosed as schizophrenic, and we really didn't know there was like a lang- bit of a language barrier there. Mm-hmm. And you know, they tried to put him on some medication, and he found himself in some pretty um, scary situations with the police, where right. he was just. Um, dissociated and he was out of his mind he's not a violent kid or anything Mm -hmm. but you know they could barely understand what he was saying because he speaks you know spanish and he had a really deep voice and he was out of his element and you know it it got him in some situations that i felt just terrible about you know like Mm -hmm. i felt like kind of in a way we let him down you know because some of those some of those things he was taking were coming from you know his friends Mm -hmm. and uh, i didn't really know that at the time but certainly um, he was my first um, example of, of sort of what can happen if you overload on too many psychedelics and you have sort mm-hmm. of sort of underlying mental health problems. And uh, that was right, a real right. eye opener for me. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's good, though. You're keeping the kids safe here. We got don't do drugs, kids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Take it from us. We're experienced. No. So um, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb here. It's like a lot of people I know that are in your same boat have had to bounce around from this medication. And then we're going to try that medicate, or maybe this one works for a minute and that one doesn't work for a minute or mm-hmm. something like that. Have you been, have you been just bounced around the, 
the medical um, community or, or how has it been like sort of treating your symptoms in the last 13 or 14 years here? Um, you know, at the very start, I was taking this medication called Zyprexa, which is an antipsychotic. And I think I was taking as much as 30 milligrams a day, which is a lot for that particular one. And I was just sleeping all day, not wanting to do anything. And I remember I had this doctor. He wasn't a doctor. He was like a resident. So he was like in school or something and like doing his residency thing. And uh, he was kind of like, well, you know, if you want, we, you know, there's this other medication called lithium. We can try it, but it's really up to you. And I remember my sister was kind of disappointed with that guy because he was basically asking me, the person who is sleeping 14 hours a day, like what I want to do, like what's my opinion? Like I didn't really have an opinion. Like what kind of drugs do you want, man? Yeah, so my no. sister was like, just put him on the... I think it was my sister. She was like, just put them on the lithium. We'll try it out. And I've been on lithium for like, must be almost 10 years now. And, you know, we've bounced around a little bit since then and tried other stuff. And it kind of is a little nasty because it can, um, lithium can kind of mess up your kidneys. You got to get regular blood tests to make sure there's not too much of it in your blood. And I think it has, it has some other side effects that, you know, I, um, it's hard to remember them all the time because I, <laughs> I, I, I try to put that stuff past me sometimes and just not think about it. Sure. But, you know, the lithium has been doing a good job of keeping my symptoms under control and, uh, you know, it kind of slows me down and, you know, my sex drive hasn't been that great, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of a taboo topic talking about stuff like that. But I mean, this is like a candid interview. So it's like, I figure everything goes and I'm not like being safe, going, in, space, going into details, here, specifics yeah, yeah. or anything. It's just like, you know, once when you're taking these types of drugs, a lot of stuff just slows down and you're like, you know what, I might have to, just work a little harder, grind a little harder, just compete a little harder, just to keep up with everyone else who is hustling around me. Because at the same time as you should throw a bone to people who have mental health issues, you know, the world isn't going to slow down for us and wait for us to catch up. We got to kind of get on our get on the ball a little bit and be like okay we might have to work a little harder just to be on the same level as people who don't have to deal with any of that and that's just the reality that I've come to accept and but you have the self-awareness about it which yeah uh, seems to be um well that's got to be helpful at least especially if you having to work a little harder than everyone else just to sort of keep pace Mm -hmm. hmm. well it's cool that you've recognized that yeah. yeah i mean I, I know like you know i don't think i'm dealing with what you're dealing with um mentally but i've certainly had a lot of my own issues and anger problems really and when i'm in that state of mind it can be hard to sort of i just get lost you know and i mm -hmm. you, you know i could become a very unpleasant person mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's hard to sort of keep track of what's important you know or what we're mm -hmm. what we're focused on what we're working towards mm -hmm. and it's very easy to kind of be all kind of doom and gloom and like when one th when one thing maybe like one bad thing happens in your life get hyper fixated on that and be like oh see this is just proof that like nothing in my life goes right when in reality it's like no, a lot of things have been going right. And a lot of things have been going like progressing and moving towards like more prosperity. And like, you have to keep a perspective on that 
sort of progress and like the fact that you're ma- that you're making that kind of progress because it's like if you let the little negative you know I've, I've, I'm such a negative person sometimes but if you let that negativity get to you you won't uh, get as far I guess so well and I know I had a friend in high school who had some similar um, mental health issues that you're dealing with mm-hmm. and you know he's uh, he hung himself you know yeah he yeah. was just getting these really crazy hallucinations he thought there was snipers in the trees that were yep. going to kill him and then he would go outside to try to find the guy and the guy would be gone he would go back yep. in the house and the sniper would be back in the tree you know yep. and he it just really it drove him out of his mind and he ended up killing himself and uh, yeah. you know rest in peace Very sad. um you know so um yeah I'm, I'm glad that you found something that works for you buddy because i'm hoping you'll stick around here for a minute I'd like to, yeah. <laughs> uh, I bet, you know, like, I imagine it's sort of like when I'm bartending and I'm standing, you know, people talk about hearing voices or something, you know, I imagine standing in a crowded restaurant where I'm just listening to a thousand different mm-hmm. conversations constantly. And yeah. I don't really give a shit about any of them. And some of them are assholes and mm-hmm. some of them are going to say mean shit to me and just trying to like, just working in that environment, you know, with noise all the time is a lot for me. It's overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and I imagine um, it could be something similar when, when you're dealing with with sort of hallucinations in your brain. Yeah, I didn't really start having the auditory hallucinations hardcore until like 2019. And because they were so new and because I had not really had time to build like defense mechanisms in my own mind to like protect myself and be like, okay, this is real. This is not real. And keep the, keep them separate. You know, I thought like, it's kind of like the classic kind of stuff you hear from other people who have being diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia like you know oh I thought like the government was like talking to me I thought like the CIA or the like uh, my phone or something the military and stuff like that and you know of course it was all bullshit it was just like you know I guess the way I rationalized it is my brain was just like creating these voices to that I was playing for myself and it was just I don't know that you know modern medicine has gone so far but as far as like explaining like okay what is what's actually happening when when someone is experiencing for example auditory hallucinations and they say oh like it's a chemical imbalance it's like oh a chemical imbalance it's like it sounds like something pretty high tech for just like a chemical imbalance you're you're hearing full yeah right ideas and thoughts of like people voices of distinct people you can't even you know some of them you can recognize and some of them are just strangers and it's like you know i think there's some stuff that our brains do that just hasn't been explained yet and maybe will never fully be explained i agree much like much the same way that some of these medications the doctors prescribe for us when you ask them well how does this medic medication work how does it make you feel better it's like well we don't really know we just know that when we when this patient takes the medication the symptoms go away and that's how we know it works. So, so they can't really explain the mechanism that is right. actually making right. it work. They just know, oh, it this will get your head to shut up for a couple of days exactly. or something. Exactly, you know? exactly. And that's like, you know, I don't want to get into the whole like, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is like this multi-billion dollar industry and there. get into it get into it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i mean doctors are basically from, from my understanding they get kickbacks and hospitals get kickbacks from pharmaceutical companies for put to push the drugs so mm-hmm. as so as long as they're pushing the drugs they're every everybody involved in the whole scheme is making money so it's like 
you well, know, that's how we ended up with to... the, that's sort of how we ended up with the Oxycontin problem. You know, they said, Oh, right, it's totally right. safe, not addictive. The doctors started cranking it out to everyone and their mother. And then you look 10 years later, we got the worst heroin problem in America here in Vermont. Right. And there was a lot of free vacations that a lot of doctors went on and a lot of pharmaceutical mm -hmm. reps, a lot of kickbacks. Absolutely. Right. Mm. And at the same time that I'm like, oh, you know, I kind of have to put a little bit of faith in some of these doctors and some of these psychiatrists to like help me out because like I actually need it. At the mm -hmm. same time, I'm like, this is kind of like, you know, you're kind of dancing with the devil in a, in a certain sense because it's not all this like Cinderella story of you're going to get better and everything is gonna be like your life is gonna right. some people do not get life. better you know and that must yeah. be super frustrating when that's happening yeah. mm. that's an interesting take on it. a dance with the devil you know like for sure like i got psoriatic arthritis right i gotta stab myself with the humera pen every two mm -hmm. weeks i didn't want to do that at all but right. the, joint, the joint pain was just so incredible dude i was like if this is the rest of my life dude i might as well just get a wheelchair now yeah exactly because it was just it, the pain was that bad you know, and so it's like, all right, well, now I got to fucking dance with this devil for the rest of my life every two weeks. Right. Yeah. You know? And those pens cost twenty seven hundred dollars a piece. God damn it. Mm hmm. If I didn't have insurance, I'd be fucked. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yes. Thanks for diving into that, man. I really you know, um, you're one of the few people that I, I feel like I can talk to about this kind of stuff that's been very mm -hmm. open about it, because some of these it's a weird conversation to have like hey man tell me about like the voices you're hearing like does one of them sound like your ex-girlfriend like is she a right. bitch like you know who's talking to you what are they saying you know um right yeah so thanks man thanks for sharing man no problem hell yeah i was really hoping you'd get into that stuff <laughs> mm. i've been talking a lot about the mental health with my cannabis interviews you know um mm. asking people a lot of people treating their symptoms um, although I feel like you might have said sometimes the cannabis is not super helpful. Um, For me, sometimes it is, you know, usually if I just take a couple puffs, it'll, you know, I feel kind of cool. Like it's like a cool feeling. But if I, uh, you know, if, if I if I get a little too stoned, it like jump starts a couple things in my brain that are like a little too close to like what it was like when the hallucinations were going full blast. So like and sometimes I just do it anyway. I'm like, oh, I know the past like 12 times I've gotten really high. I've, you know kind of it's made me feel a little weird but maybe it won't on the 13th time <laughs> and lo and behold i'm like well i guess i didn't learn that lesson again <laughs> lucky number 13 yeah mm. yeah well i certainly I, you know i could definitely like the edibles will get me if i'm like out in public sometimes and i just catch a little bit too much and i'm like start getting anxiety and i start like having trouble breathing Mm -hmm. and i just like it's uncomfortable which is all the reasons why like i love smoking weed is because it makes me comfortable <laughs> and right. now if you go fuck up and take too many edibles or something now i get the exact opposite where i'm just like mm -hmm. i think i'm gonna have a panic attack i might have to go to the hospital i think i'm gonna be the first <laughs> guy to die from weed you know? and, it's, and it starts spiraling like that which can get right. in your head and then it you know when I get in my head, it's, you know, it's, it can spiral like that and just right. kind of get sort of out of hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, we got some nice weed sponsors coming up here. Um, <laughs> before we get to that too, I, I was hoping that we did, we did the backstory. We dug into some mental health uh, stuff. I was really hoping you would walk us through your, your record collection here. Um, damn, I, I didn't realize we might, boy, we must've met right around 2019, huh? somewhere right back then yeah just a few years ago i think where did i meet you it was uh i think we met on the internet and then i just right. came to burlington one time i was like i asked justin boland about you i was like who is this kid he's kind of a fucking madman but i kind of like him and i think right. we could be friends nice and he was like oh yeah i think so too and then he he told me to hit you up and i don't remember the first time we hung out but i feel like i can't well, i remember meeting on the internet that sounds about right 
Yeah, Tinder. I super liked you. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I meet everybody, man. And, you know, like, <laughs> I really appreciate what Justin's done with the, the hip hop pages over there, man. I thought that's yes. been a kind of a great way to um, bring people together and facilitate these kind of connections. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I gotta, I gotta give props to Justin because no matter how good of a job he does, there's always going to be people that are saying he's not doing good enough. But here he's really been busting his ass. And, you know, he even even if he leaves somebody out or makes a mistake once in a while, whenever he does include someone and uh, talk about their music or a project or something, he really does his homework and mm-hmm. kind of is a good wordsmith and comes up with the right words to talk about it. So, you know, good for him for doing that and for not, you know, basically doing it for free just so people have you know, people within the scene and people outside the scene can. Right, and there's two uh, separate pages. There's one for like the yeah. artists and then there's one for just like fans. There's right. always somebody bitching at him about being a right. culture vulture or yep. fucking whatever it is that they're complaining about. But honestly, mm-hmm. I think he's done probably as much for Vermont hip hop as anybody ever. I think so, yeah. In my opinion, you know, I know he hasn't been rapping as much lately, but I see he's dropping a couple tunes here. Out, but. I think he's trying to get back into the groove a little bit, which I respect. Mm-hmm. And is yeah. cool. I think you really spit it, man. That's the reason yeah. I got into hip hop was yeah, uh, really the Wu-Tang Clan and Justin Boland. Nice. He used to rock parties up in the Northeast Kingdom. You know, he'd just be out in Danville in a fucking field. He'd, sometimes you'd have his dude with like a mandolin and some fucking congas. And yep. they would, yeah, they would just rock it out hippie style, dude. And I was so yep. impressed, man. He would freestyle all night, you know. And yeah. I was really just that's why I started making beats way back in the day. It was like, I'm gonna, I can't rap as good as this dude. So I'm gonna start making beats and I'll just be the dude who makes his beats. And, yeah. You know, so that was my that was my sort of inspiration here. Um, let me ask you, uh, how did you sort of come up? Um, who were some of the people that influenced your your game plan and uh Maybe, you know, how did that lead you to making your, your first album? Uh, well, in middle school, I remember some of my first CDs that I got. They were censored versions of the uh, Chronic 2001. And I think it was the Slim Shady LP. And I remember <laughs> listening to those. And, like, you know, I have... You know, Eminem's cool. He he has his place in the in the whole scene of you know in the whole scheme of things. Oh, yeah. You know, I was and, 16 back in high school. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like, you know, but at the time, if you're just a little kid and you're and you're hearing that stuff, it's like, oh, it's pretty impressive. So and then in high school, it was I got more into like Wu Tang clan. And uh it was mostly Wu Tang in high school. And, uh, you know, basically in high school, I met my friend Chris Morrell, who who you might know as Face One. Uh, Yeah, yeah. And he was like, he was like recording and performing hip hop, like before this whole wave of like, it was when the internet was like just kind of still the wild west and it was before everyone was rapping and I kind of saw him doing that and I looked up to him and I was makes like, wow, wild that's kind of cool. His Sorry? production style his production style is very unique and I yeah, yeah I, I remember a few years back he used to come out to my comedy show sometimes when I'd come mm-hmm. to Burlington. He'd be the only dude in the back laughing at fucking yeah. half lunch, you know. Um yeah. But yeah, his I really liked his his production style, man. It was a little bit different, a little bit spooky, and I, I really like to hear people just trying new things. Yeah, his his production style kind of has like an attitude to it that's very like particular to him, and it's very cool to um. It's just super cool, yeah. So that was your first crew with you and Face. Me and Face, yeah, basically, and we knew this dude. Um, just from going to parties and stuff, we knew this dude, Mantone, who ended up being like a co-owner of the Janky Arts Collective. Oh. And uh, not, he not had not. he had this, his crib on like Manhattan Drive where he had some, 
I guess we found out he had some recording equipment, which was like kind of rare at the time. And Face was like, hey, like, we're going to roll up to the spot tomorrow. Like, just prepare something. And we'll <laughs> you're the rapper. <laughs> Go. Yeah, I've never done. I had never done anything like that. And I prepared two songs. I memorized them. And we got there. And I um, I got them both in one take. And we listened back to it. And it sounded really good. And Face, you know, Chris was like, this sounds great. Like, I'll put a quick mix on it. You can put it on your SoundCloud. And those songs are still on my, I don't really use my SoundCloud <laughs> anymore, but I leave it up. And those two songs are on my SoundCloud still right now. They're called Mr. Peanut and Tungsten Ads on Gmail. <laughs> Sick. And the second one is a little better. And, uh, you know, they, they aren't like revolutionary but they sounded pretty good for the time and they, they were like just like proof that i could rap if i wanted to yeah he sounds was, like he sounds like he just put you on the spot huh he's like go write a yeah, song exactly you 24 hours yeah exactly and, and that was off. that was what made chris be like okay like we're gonna make an we're gonna make you an album and that's basically how it went so we made one for very little it was very low budget and it was kind of it was a cool album. Um, what was it, it was called? called? The Meltdown. Hmm. When, when did that come out? 2012. It was in like Sept August or September of 2012. Okay, way back. Yeah, t about 10 years ago. Yeah, well, this was, ago. I remember watching the come up of sort of like the home studios where it went from like right. very expensive to suddenly everybody's got MIDI controllers and fucking that shit was affordable at home and you could just... Yeah sit there and make beats and write in your room, you know, which really kind of changed up the whole game for a lot of people in, in some bad ways and some good ways, you know, because now yeah. anyone can do it, but now anyone can do it. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Hmm. 2012, way back then, huh? I didn't yep. scroll back far enough before this interview. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much time went by before the Gangster Trail mix? Well, I put out a short EP which was five songs in 2013. And that was almost like a continuation of the, of the meltdown. It was kind of like, uh, like an extension of that. But then before Gangsta Trail Mix came out, so that was 2013 and Gangsta Trail Mix came out in 2018. That was like a good, a solid like five years. And what are you just taking some some downtime? You weren't feeling it. What would you? What were you doing in there? I don't know. I ha for a good chunk of time, um, for a good chunk of time, I had like a full time office job, which was like really draining. <laughs> you don't strike me as an office job kind of guy, Merrick. No. <laughs> <laughs> I um I had a I had my first girlfriend around that time. Mm. So, yeah, and, you <laughs> yeah. know, my mental health wasn't the best around for some of those years, and it just, like, you know, just stuff wasn't, you know, I was just kind of focusing on myself, and it was not, you know, I wasn't really at the point where I could keep that momentum going on music. So I just didn't do the music for a while. And, you know, I did the corner store thing, which was me on clarinet and Luke Gothier Illu oh, yeah. on the beats. And we did, we had some fun shows and that was, that was fun. And what, that you corner of, stores. What? No, it was it was a band called Corner Store. Oh, okay. I thought you just said you were gonna like roll up to Murder Mart or something. Just... No, no, we had this band called Corner Store, okay. and uh, our friend Nick Streeter was the bassist for a little while on on that band a little for a bit. But that was like a connection to the scene, even even though I wasn't like rapping or putting out albums that much, and I was kind of like a little bit showing up to the monkey house and like I forget when I started showing up to third Thursdays but like I was kind of freestyling a little bit and people knew me as that guy who would show up and just like freestyle with people and was like okay 
But um, I think when I came out with Gangster Trail Mix in 2018, it was kind of a, a surprise to a lot of people. Hmm. Like, and oh, you laid, you laid it down nicely. Like that. Yeah, that was a good... That, and, you know, I remember the Justin Bolin write-up, and that actually might have been uh, when I introduced myself to you. Because, mm -hmm. like, you know, when, when you get some some words like that from, from Justin, you know, I know... At least all the rappers I know, they look forward to that shit. You know, it might be a small, might be seven days right up, but like, yeah, Justin's words really like. If I was a rapper, that's who I want to hear from. You know, like exactly. tell me, tell me how I'm doing. Right. Mm. And who put that uh, album together? The Gangster Trail mix was that an Illu uh, project? That was all Illu on the beats, and we put that out on the Equalize Records label. Mm. Word up. I love their logo too, man. Definitely. Those fucking eyeballs trip me out every time. Super cool. <laughs> um so what, uh, Bill? Then we had then we had Ma Magnus for Magnuson? Magnus for Mavison, yes. Mavison, sorry, I didn't mean to slaughter the name of it there. That's okay. What uh, see, I used to watch those strongman competitions too. I'm curious yeah. what uh your wh why'd you pick that name? Well, me, Humble, and Chris Dizzy one time were, like, chilling out at this little, like, spot, uh, like, off of Oak Ledge. And we called it, like, the council area because it was, it was kind of like a circle of stones and you could kind of hold council there. And we were just, like, chilling there. And I think we might have been drinking a couple beers or doing whatever. Allegedly. Yeah. And I wanted to like sit with my friends. So I like I grabbed this uh I grabbed like a hundred or a hundred fifty pound stone that I wanted to use as a chair. I picked it up, I carried it over closer to everybody else, and I and I let and I set it down and you know. Humble was like super impressed. He's like, yo, that's like some strongman shit. You know what I mean? That's the fucking story. You just needed yeah. a chair. <laughs> yeah, I just needed a chair. I thought you were gonna tell me you always wanted to be a power lifter or something. <laughs> Maybe someday. No, just sitting down. Um, and you guys, bro, you guys did a really nice uh, music video for one of those tunes under the bridge with uh, it looked like Scotty. Uh, maybe yes. hooked up a nice mural for you down there. Tell me about that day. Yeah, that was a super cool day. I had to coordinate a few different people to be available on that day. I had to get the day off from work. I had to make sure Scotty was available to paint the mural. And I had to make sure Brad Vasey could come down from Southern Vermont to shoot the video. And everything just aligned. And I ended up... You know, I had asked Scotty if he could, uh, shouts out Ant Hill Collective, mm -hmm. if he could do like a Mavstar like tag for me. And he was like, yeah, sure. Just, you know, throw me some bones for it. Nothing crazy. And, you know, we'll hook it up. And so I was like, yeah, let's make it part of the video. Let's make a video. Let's have me with the powerlifting shoes and the bell, like picking up the rock at the end of the video, lifting it over my head and dropping it with the whole uh, sample of, um, what's his name? I'm blanking on his name right now, but. Isn't it the guy from the Box of Michael Buffer? Bruce Buffer, one of the buffers, right? Let's get ready to run, that guy? No, it was the announcer from the uh, World's Strongest Man competition. Oh shit. His name, uh, I know his name. It's uh oh yeah, Colin Bryce. No, I don't remember him. He he was like the announce, he was like the announcer in one of uh Magnus for Magnuson's uh uh one of his um you know feats of strength that was had like a whole crowd of people, like a full stadium full of people and then televised and all that stuff so. so you got a sample from that dude yeah actually i almost got in some trouble with that really because 
Because you didn't clear your samples, did no, you? No, I didn't clear my samples. <laughs> but I went on Twitter and this guy, Colin Bryce, had tagged me. He was like, apparently a rapper named Mavstar used our audio in one of his songs, which normally would be pretty cool and like flattering. But we're the ones that got tagged with the copyright infringement thing. So oh, it's shit. Like, so basically, I caused him a little extra work by making him go and prove to the copyright people who I, I don't even know who those people are who you're supposed to contact but basically prove that it's his actual damn that's wild so audio. you you sniped his sample and used it on your song and they went after him yeah i guess because it went through like spotify or whatever they oh, must have evil. some legal team or something and they're like oh we that audio is ours now like oh is, is someone trying to make money off their own audio i don't fucking right, think exactly so. i know you've had some choice we, we, we cleared we cleared it up and like everything's cool now so that's cool yeah. i always said a, a, a lawsuit for me might be good for business just because nobody knows who the fuck i am you know exactly <laughs> you yeah. know? then justin Bolin used to tell me you know um, hopefully by the time they get around to suing you, you'll be making money and you can just pay them off and <laughs> keep moving. <Right. laughs> mm. Cool. Well, that's nice that they were chill about it because they could certainly be dicks about that if they want to. True. Mm. Now, I'd be curious. Um, what are your thoughts on, on Spotify? You mentioned Spotify, and I know you've had some choice words for, for Spotify. I'd be curious to hear some of your thoughts on that. Well. I know most, like, it's my understanding that most people use Spotify to listen to music because it's, I don't know if most people use the free version or if most people pay for it, but you can basically just find any song, you can make a playlist, you can, you know, it's easy to listen to whatever you want to listen to and like, that's cool, you know that's I can see why the convenience and the just having the whole almost the whole world of music at your fingertips on one app like I could see how that's very convenient and I think that's cool but um you know I think as far as like getting royalties off Spotify I think it's like point like per listen from per song it's like point zero zero five cents or some ridiculously small amount of money off of based off of every play so unless you're getting a ridiculous amount of plays off spotify you're not really making money off it and even if you do have that many plays you'd be much better off on like a platform like bandcamp where it's like okay let's say you have a million people listen to your song to, to your album on bandcamp let's say out of one every one every one out of every like a thousand people buy your song or your or your album so like a thousand people out of a million that would be like a thousand people paying for your track and that's like you can make like a thousand or if you're if you're getting like a million plays you can make like I don't know, ten thousand dollars or something like that. But, but like, you could maybe um, actually scratch out a little living, whereas it sounds right. like with Spotify, or, or you'd just, have to, yeah. you'd have to be Gangnam style just to make fucking rent money. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, like, at least on Bandcamp, there's some avenue to make money. That's like, okay, someone actually paid ten bucks for something. You know what I mean? And they do the um, don't they do every Friday? Um, every the first Friday of every month and what is that how does that deal work for you guys basically normally Bandcamp takes like a 10 to 20 percent cut off of any sale but on Bandcamp Fridays um but on Bandcamp Fridays basically they let you keep all your proceeds so you oh, okay. make so the artist gets to keep a little bit more of their dough. So they turn the they turn the vig off for one day a right. month. Okay. Right. And I know um Jarv's album's coming out today, the amalgam. 
and mm-hmm. uh, he's trying to capitalize on that Bandcamp Friday thing. So I hope yep. anyone, if it's if this is coming out today, that's you know, gonna be tomorrow I'm, probably. But oh, okay. Well, that'll yeah. be too late. But you know, I, just, I just dropped another one this morning, so I, oh, yeah. I like to let him air out. But yeah, Jarv's album yeah. was sounding great. I really loved that yes. video that he did. Uh, that blue. Oh, shit. I like that video too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really like where he's headed. Definitely. He's a good kid. Uh, you know, he's he's one of those dudes that I really thought was going to put Vermont on the map when I met him. Right. You know, and I know some people didn't really like that super fast style that he was using or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, it looks like he's really coming into his own here and and kind of slowing it down and being a little more thoughtful. And I really like where he's headed. Those guys. I, like whole he's headed to, I, I think, you know. He has not uh, he's still, the you know, he's. You know, played so many shows, come, came out with so much music, has so many shows. fans now, and so many people following what he's doing. But he's still, like, to me, he's still that same sweet kid that you, from Windsor that you first met back in the day that likes to skateboard and get drunk and have fun with his friends. So I really appreciate that he's kept true to Hell yeah. stay true to himself, you know? Mm-hmm. I, do, I do like hanging out with those guys. They did a festival yeah. over in... Plainfield or Marshfield somewhere a few years back and oh boy this drunk redneck almost got into it with with Ethan and we had a fucking <laughs> that was a good time <laughs> I like hanging out with those guys yeah nice. Tease, Tease is a good shit too he is good uh, shit they got good um chemistry there Definitely. um what else do we got here we got through the Spotify we got through your albums did we miss any albums or any projects that you put out that I fucking glossed over well my big thing for this year was a single i did with a video called uh, alpha centauri with humble on it Mm. and that i think it sounds good and um we got some lessons on that you know we got a couple lessons there a couple lessons there so that was cool didn't you put that out on your mom's birthday i did yes wasn't that my idea Possibly, yes. Yes, it was. You were uh-huh. looking for a release date. You said, well, it's my mom's birthday coming up. I was like, hey, make a song for mom. Exactly. Song for mom. Your mom's is dope, too. She's I cool, like, yeah. I like your mom. Hmm, I don't understand what the fuck she's saying, but she's very welcoming. <laughs> <warm>. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Maybe you guys could teach me a, a new language. Exactly. <laughs> Word up. Well, uh, I want to get to the uh, shameless plug here um, for the the green door thing here. So I'm going to let you take this one away. Okay, cool. There is a show happening Saturday, December 3rd. So like tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah. Today when you see this today, when you see it, it's um, so it's basically Ant Hill presents Mavstar and Friends. And it's sponsored by Forbin's Finest, Winooski Organics, and King James Cannabis. Oh, yeah. And we got some great MCs performing. We've got myself. Uh, we got MC Humble, Chris Dizzy, Omega Jade. Shorty Bang, Young Breeze, and Subtex. And they're all performing. It's BYOB, um, $10 suggested donation, and it's all going down at the Green Door Studio, which is 4 Howard Street. It's right across from dealer.com off of Pond. Uh, doors at 8, show starts at 9. Hmm. And if there are any MCs that like to freestyle, we usually begin and end our shows with like a freestyle cipher, just keeping it, keeping it oh, hip hop, cool. keeping it fun and just like whatever, whatever, you know. You take it off, baby. Um, do you have a DJ? Yes, we do have a DJ. DJ Kanga is going to be holding down the wheels that guy. and he's going to kill it. So uh, definitely give thanks to your DJ. Kyle is just great at parties, man. The last, the last <laughs> joint we rolled up to at Green Door, uh, whatever they were doing there, the silent disco or yep. or whatever. I think you were there too. Um, that was a little different. I've never tried something like that, but I really just, I love. Anytime I run into Scotty, is a mm-hmm. fucking 
great day. And the Absolutely. crowd, the crowd that he brings in down there, um, it's just, you know, always good people. There's never any fucking beef or any, you know, it's not like oh, a rap show yeah. where there's eight fights outside after, <laughs> you know, everyone's having a good time. He's usually got some nice art hanging up on the walls. Yep. He lets us bring drinks, <laughs> you know? Yeah. The, so the venue is an art studio where Scotty, where uh, Scotty Raymond and Cole Christman and Steve Sharon and we'll see they all yeah. have, are going to have their art hung up. So, you know, while you're enjoying the nice hip hop, you're more than welcome to look around and look at all the paintings. And basically, I'm pretty sure everything, uh, everything you see, if it doesn't have a little price next to it, how much it is, you can probably ask the... Um, the artist who painted it and they'll let you know if it's for sale or not, which I'm pretty sure most. I was going to say they're usually are. selling everything in there. They're like, Yo. they're, I'm pretty sure they're selling everything in there. So, if, it ain't, uh, if it ain't glued to the wall, it's for sale. Yeah. You know, I actually got a painting last time. Nice. Um, Nicole. What was the other woman's name? Nicole Kirschman. Nicole Chrisman. Chrisman. She's yep. also phenomenal. She's super cool. And, and nice Will as well. I got to meet yes. Will. He was a great guy. We sat out there shooting the shit for probably two or three hours last time yep. I was in town. I'm really looking forward to seeing him. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm super pumped to help you put these shows together, man. Like, I wish we could have got you a little bit more dough, but I know all the weed companies are, are hurting right now. Everyone's tight for money, but um, on yeah, a personal... Yeah, the end of the year, so... Yeah. On a personal note, um, I just have had a blast trying to um, bring people together here and I fucking mm -hmm. love what you're doing dude I love what Wes was doing yeah um, and I really you know anything I can do to continue to facilitate that into the future man I just love you know I get to go hang out with Kyle listen to him spin records listen to you guys rhyme check out some art see the homies it's just a beautiful time absolutely mm -hmm. and I appreciate you connecting me with the cannabis folks like you know even if I was only able to get a certain amount in sponsorship money, at least making myself known and be like, Hey, nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Like maybe I'll sh come shake some, shake your hand sometime or whatever. Sure. You know, you know and just it. building those, building those connections for down the road, you know, cause like yeah. the, the weed game ain't going to be stagnant forever. Eventually right. when the money starts rolling, like people are going to are already talking about doing sort of bigger events next summer. Yep. Um, and I'd love to put together maybe like an outdoor festival or something um, with a lot of rappers here, maybe down at the Oxbow in Morrisville or something, you know, that'd be super cool. Yeah, I just like I like putting shows together and I like fucking hanging out with my friends. And I don't get to do it very often. Exactly. You know, the whole COVID thing messed up everything, but now we're still like, you know, we're like socializing and doing events and stuff but it's only it's like people are like like gradually tiptoeing into the realm of like okay if i put out if i put on a show like will people show up like yeah. i'll try it mm. and you might have like once every month someone does something like that so I know some people are like, hell yeah, I've been looking for an excuse to come out. Like, mm -hmm. I'm super down. And I'm hope that there's a lot of people uh, like that that are going to be at the show that were just like, oh, like, I haven't really hung out with anyone for like a month or two. Like, there's this hip hop show that's easy to get to. You can bring your own alcohol, bring whatever you want, whoever you want, you know, as long as you're respectful and, you know just like don't fuck with scotty's joint yeah exactly <laughs> my mom's will have your ass on a fucking skewer exactly yeah and that's dude like i'll say it again man it just i feel like i never have to worry about that when i go hang out with scotty exactly i yeah. feel like no matter who shows up there it's gonna be a good time you know scotty just doesn't attract a lot of shitheads man he attracts good loving human beings that's and, the way it uh, should be yeah mm -hmm. well he's that kind of guy you know he's right he's been out here forever building those relationships and honestly it's been cool to see his artwork in capes 
I see some of the, the Stone Leaf cool. Cannabis guys. They got uh, Winooski Organics got a piece up from mm -hmm. them in the dispensary. Uh, Green Man and St. Jay. So I got some. I got some shows for you guys. I got some pain gigs for these guys. This is great, man. Like super great. Yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. Maybe I'll kick a freestyle with you. Nice. <laughs> Maybe I'll bring a beat, dude. I'll have Kyle throw on a, a, one of my classic bangers. And we'll fucking... Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll dust off the old rapid shoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. This is great. So uh, tomorrow night, December 3rd, 8 o'clock, Green Door Studios. What would you say? 4 Howard Street? Yes. $10 suggested donation. Bring some fucking cash for these guys, please. Please pay your oh, goddamn and performance. unless whatever... God hates us or whatever. There's going to be grilling. Uh, we're going to have some some cheeseburgers and some hot dogs. It's not going to be like enough to feed all of Shittenden County. But if you show up early and you're hungry, and even if you're sticking around for the long haul and we have a couple of dogs or burgers sticking, you know, kicking around towards the end of the night, you know, uh, Five dollar cheeseburgers, two dollar hot dogs. So, are you are you out. gonna make me a hot dog? You got two bucks. Absolutely. You can as have long a as hot you cook dog it. I want bucks. I want you to cook it. Oh, <laughs> it'd probably taste better if Scotty cooked it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Merrick Lawrence. Um, Thank you so much for joining me, my friend. This has been a pleasure. I always leave the last word for my guests here. So if you got anything else on the way out here, this is all you and I'll see you tomorrow night, buddy. Okay, my last words are, I'm a star in this game. I really hope that, and I'm gonna leave it at that. Beautiful. Take care, my friend. I will see you in 28 hours. Okay, see you then. Take care, my friend. Thanks for doing this interview with me. I had a lot of fun, so it was cool to like talk and have fun and stuff. Me too. I was feeling like shit, but that actually felt good. Nice. Hell yeah. Nice. All right, Hell buddy. Yeah. Take care. All right, peace, buddy. Take care.